Next, for our conversation on free speech and the internet, please welcome the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, with Atlantic staff writer, Alexis Madrigal. Hello. Um, so I'm a firm believer that sometimes the dumbest questions yield uh, the best answers. Uh, and we're going to test that theory out right off the top here. Um, what is YouTube? Oh. <laughs> I mean, in a serious way, though. Like, yeah. how do you think of it now? Yeah. Um, well, great first question. Um, so we think about YouTube, and our goal with YouTube is to be the best video service um, and have the largest collection of videos where our users can come and not just watch videos, but also engage with videos, and also be a place where anyone can upload, have a global audience, and potentially turn their passion into a business. So what I'm hearing is it's a sort of a, a global collection of videos, and it's also a, a media service, a, like a platform. It, yes, so we, I mean, over the years, YouTube has accumulated an incredible library of videos. And we have all kinds of videos, probably every speech. We probably have previous speeches from here. Um, we have an incredible how-to library. So people all over come and tell me things that they learned on YouTube, from how to fix their ice maker to they learned the My language. My water heater. Right. Their water yeah. heater, everything um, you can learn on YouTube. In fact, I had this problem, the pump on my pool wasn't working, which is, and I called them, how do you fix this? And they were like, we actually have a YouTube video to fix it. So <laughs> it's like, okay, I should have thought about that. Um, so we have this incredible collection of videos, and so our goal is to keep building this incredible collection. And I think what's really unique about YouTube and having been an online um, platform is that we've been able to create these new genres. So if you look at traditional media, uh, you know, we, there were a limited number of channels. And when you have a limited number of channels, you're always going to focus on what is content that's going to appeal to the broadest set of people. But when you have uh, you know, millions of channels, you can have millions of different topics that you cover. And those topics can range on anything from woodworking to Pilates to, like, how to raise chickens. And so our um, ability to, ha to have these new genres of how-to. Gaming is really big right. on YouTube. We have fashion and beauty on YouTube. Um, we have highlights of everything. And so it's just this incredible collection of videos. And it's been accumulated because so many people have been able to contribute to that library. And because people who will have taken their passions will you know, they'll start just uploading one video, and then they'll wind up realizing, oh, look, there's a lot of people who are interested in this. Um, so for example, we, we know this family, the McKnight family, and they have six kids, and they, the mom would do these incredible hairstyles of like different braids, you know, braids on the left, braids in the back. Like mm -hmm. Everyone always wonders, how do you do these braids? And so she would film herself doing the kids' braids, and then she would post it on YouTube, and she intended just for other people at the school to see them. So she showed it to them. And then she realized that uh, people all over the world were looking at these braids. And there was actually a really big audience for, for braids. Um, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, because I mean, they're hard to do. Right, and you right. need to see it. And you can't really read a book to figure out how to do that braid. And so they now have, um, now it's a family business. Um, everyone in their, their, the husband has quit his job. Um, full-time braider. It's a yeah. full-time, um, and they have over 5 million subscribers. And then it turned out the kids who were having their hair braided, you never actually saw them in the videos. Um, they're, they're now in college, but it turns out they're twins. There are actually two of them, Brooklyn and Bailey. And then they wound up having their own channel, and they also have millions of subscribers now, too. So I think what's interesting is that you kind of slid from one way that I think about YouTube, which is as this, yeah, almost uh, limitless archive of like cultural production of, of all different kinds, historical, contemporary, and other things. And then this other version of YouTube, which is like the stars, which is like the, the tiny sliver of people who become basically professionals um, in this. And I'm, I'm curious if you see those two things as, as being intention, like the global catalog of video and this fairly concentrated 
um, set of people who see themselves uh, as the creator community. Mm -hmm. well, well, so I think if you look at the evolution of YouTube, it started out where people would have just uploaded a video of something they saw in their life um, that was interesting, like, you know, tr like just the kind of quintessential cats on skateboards, right? It started with that. Right. But then people, there were people like the McKnights that I talked about that realized, wow, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole business here. Um, and then there were people who wound up having literally millions and millions of subscribers. And um, these are really, I would say, some of the biggest influencers today in culture. And they're what's driving our culture in so many different ways. And, um, and um, it, it makes sense because if you, you know, we have, YouTube has over 2 billion people who are coming to YouTube every month who are logged in. And um, these stars are building really next generation media companies. They might start out building in their, filming in their bedroom, um, but now they have, as they have millions of subscribers, they're coming from all over the globe, they have a global brand. Um, a lot of times that they, they have people who are helping them, so they're providing jobs. They have a merchandise line, usually. Right. Um, and so I think about this concept of creators really as next generation media companies. Um, and if you look at pretty much every country of the world, you're going to see a significant number of these creators who are creating jobs and creating content. And it's, it's different than traditional media companies, right, which had an editor and producer, um, and there were a limited number of them. You know, here, you can really have an unlimited number of them, and they're the ones who are controlling the content and what makes sense for them. Yeah. I mean, I think what kind of bound together, you kind of have these different groups, right, because you sort of have the creators, you have like YouTube corporate, you have the people who are watching the videos, um, and then uh, you have um, the, the advertisers who are yeah. kind of like powering all this. And what held them all together sort of was this idea that it was a, a platform. And one of the things I think is interesting is over the last few years, I think lots of people here have probably um, noticed that kind of that idea has started to break down a little bit. Like, can something be a platform um, without much more content moderation than it seemed like was going to be uh, in play? And I'm curious what, how you feel YouTube's role has changed as a platform, you know, say, in the last three years. Mm -hmm. it, in the last three years, probably the biggest change that we have made has been that we have been significantly tightening the policies that the platform runs on. Um, and so I think the ecosystem that you described is consistent. Um, it's grown significantly in terms of the number of users, um, our creators that, that I think about as, as really next generation media companies and businesses, and then of course advertisers that have also continued to grow. Um, and what we've seen is that because of the, of the scale and the, res the responsibility that we see that we have with the platform, we have really had to lean in a lot more to coming up with the right policies that make sense. Uh, and um, we actually call those the four R's, um, the four R's of responsibility in terms of how we um, remove content. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have made, in, since 2018, we have made 48 policy changes or changes to enforcement. Um, and those are significant because every time we make a change, that needs to be rolled out and it mm -hmm. needs to be done consistently across all of our reviewers and uh, across, um, consistently across all different types of videos. We both, we remove content. Um, we are focused on raising up authoritative information. If it is news or medical or sensitive information, um, if we have borderline content, our focus is to, that's the third R, is to reduce that. Huh. Um, and how then, do you define borderline content? Yeah, how do we define borderline content? We have, um, well, first of all, we, we have policies, and we have a set of reviewers. Those re reviewers are um, distributed around, um, they're specific for every country, and they're distributed geographically, so we get a good representation of everyone in the US. Um, and those reviewers are asked to look at a number of videos, and they have a number of questions around them, so, like, do they see this as, as potentially harmful? Um, do they see this as, you know, we have a bunch of questions, um, and we actually release the guidelines to our reviewers, so we're public about what those guidelines are. And then based on that, we determine a set of videos that we think are borderline, 
and then we use machine learning to learn from that. So there's been a lot of questions, you know, mostly for other uh, platforms, Facebook most notably, yes. about the actual, like the, the, the real process of, of reviewing and sort of the, the human beings who are doing yes. that reviewing. Yes. Um, so a lot of those questions, which I'd like to put to you are, you know, how many of those people are contractors and sort of what are the conditions under which those people are working? Because we know in some cases people have had maybe a yeah. few seconds to review content yeah. and just sort of the system itself seems designed to fail. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd say we've taken that incredibly seriously and, and um, you know, we, we all review videos. I'll say I've been personally very involved in reviewing our, our videos. Um, and when we make a policy change, I, we're going to review lots and lots of videos around that policy area. So first of all, our executives, our, our legal, our policy, um, we're all seeing a lot of those videos too. But mm -hmm. to be able to scale it, it goes out to our reviewers, most of whom are contractors. And Google has over 10,000 people who are focused on controversial content. Uh, so I thought it was really important to make sure I had an understanding of what those work conditions were like. And so I have been to a few locations where we have most of our reviewers on that. And I've sat down with the reviewers. I've met the people. I've sat in the queues. I've seen the work that they do. Mm -hmm. you know, we've gone through different videos. Um, and we've done a number of different steps to, to make sure that it's a, it's a really positive environment. Like, um, they review videos for five hours a day, but then they have the other three hours to do other types of work around the office. <laughs> and when you talk to those people, the, the one, they, they feel that they are doing a really important mission, which is helping keep the internet a safe place. And so we, we talk a lot about that. We provide all the additional services, any kind of counseling, ability to take a break, um, and, and um, other services. Actually, when I went to visit one site, I left my bag in a location, and when I came back, they were doing Zumba um, in, the, in, the, in the room. And so it's just an example of the yeah. types of services that we offer. Um, you know, we all know that, because give us a, a sense of like the scale of like how many hours of video are being uploaded yeah. per second or per minute. It's a ton, right? Yeah, so YouTube has 500 hours uploaded every minute to YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a lot of video. And again, that's how we build an incredible library that has pretty much anything, everything, right. um, anything you want to learn. Um, but it also means that to be able to manage that with the policies and to enforce that consistently, you really need to have a process and you need to use a combination of machines and people to be able to make that happen. So I think one question, because of that scale, you can't have human reviewers do it all, and so you are going to use these machine learning tools that make decisions based on the decisions humans made. What can you tell us about the signals that those algorithms use? Like, do we know why that system ends up flagging future videos based on you know, what human reviewers did? Like, how, how explicable uh, are those decisions, both internally and, and externally? So, so, whenever we, so whenever we have a policy, we announce what that policy is, we make sure that the policy can be interpreted by thousands of reviewers all over the globe in the same way. Um, and that takes many trials, so we'll do a policy, we'll roll it out, we'll see, can reviewers consistently um, give us the same ratings? for those videos. And so sometimes a policy will need to go back multiple times to be able to make sure that the human reviewers can do it consistently. Um, but basically, the way the machine learning works, just to give the, yeah. the, maybe the 20-second the version of something that's pretty complicated, is we will identify, well, what we do is we um, build first a set of videos. So let's say we're making a policy around um, I don't know, it could be you know, any area, like um, a, maybe we could choose, uh, I don't know. Nazis, um, I mean, it, we're, we're talking about the internet, so Nazis. Okay, yeah. okay, violent extremism yeah. or, or hate or something. So you, so you create a set of videos um, that, are, that you know are the types of videos that are problematic. And, and then you have what we call machine learning, and the machine learning goes out on the internet, and it, it's, you can think about it as like casting a net. And so it casts a net to try to find all the videos that are like these videos. 
Um, and it doesn't do a perfect job. It doesn't find every single one. It doesn't mean that just because it found it, it really is violative. Um, but what it does is it, we take that net of content and then we give that to human reviewers. Mm -hmm. And the human reviewers go through it with the policy and we make sure that they can do that consistently. Yeah. And the machines keep getting better and better, which means they're, they're going to find more and more of it. They're going to do so at a higher accuracy rate. Because then once you have, once the humans have told us, oh, yes, these are really violative, right. you have a you larger have collection. The yeah. And the machines will become smarter and smarter. So given, even given that, with the kind of scale that we're talking about, the system will, will make mistakes at times. Sure. The human and, and machine system together will, sure. will make mistakes. So how do you define sort of an acceptable failure rate? And what do you think the consequences should be when, it, when a decision goes wrong? Well, well, we work hard to do this at a very high level of accuracy. Um, and so, I mean, different, I'll say different policies have to, can have different levels, right? So child safety, that's one where we're going to say we need to be right all the time and we need to try to find every single example that we think is problematic. Um, we tell our advertisers for brand safety that we operate at 99%, and we say that because we want to, um, you know, brand safety, again, is an example where what's safe for one advertiser might not be safe for another advertiser, and um, there's some variance there. But, uh, but in general, like, we try to do this at as at high a level as we possibly can. Um, so yesterday on the stage, uh, Facebook's Nick Clegg said that his company had sort of a different and I, a lot of people interpret it as looser standard for politicians mm -hmm. um, on their platforms. Yeah. Um, do you think that politicians should have different standards um, on YouTube than, than other content creators because of the sort of specific nature of their speech? Yeah. I, you know, so politicians are... You know, of course, are democratically elected, at least in, in most countries. And there is, um, it's important for that content to be seen. So, you know, in general, actually, when we make policies, we have, in most cases, what we call an EDSA exception, which would be educational, documentary, scientific, or artistic. And so that would be the type of content that we would say doesn't always meet that same criteria. Um, so when you have a, a political officer that is making information that is really important for the constituents to see or for other global leaders to see, that is content um, that, we would, that we would leave up because we think it's important for other people to see. Um, one, one, thing, one important distinction I'll say is that, uh, look, even, even if we were to take it down, it would be covered by all the news stories. And, um, the news is always going to provide that information and they're going to provide it with context. So even if we take something down, a lot of that's controversial, it's often covered by the press, um, but then it has the context around it of like, this is why we left it up, this is what we think about this event that happened with a politician. Um, so you were at Google basically from its inception. Yes. Um, what do you think that Google brought to and did to YouTube when it acquired it fairly early in its life in the mid-2000s? Oh. Oh. Well, you know, so first of all, I was involved in the acquisition of, of YouTube. Um, I saw it very early on that this was something that was going to be really big. And really what I saw was the fact that I saw, I saw two things, which is that People wanted to tell their story. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Like, we would just have like a website and say, "Upload your videos," and like all these people would upload their <laughs> videos, and they would be you know, people sharing things about their lives. Like, why they wanted to share it was unclear, um, but <laughs> but lots of people want to tell their story, and I think like you know you can actually think that that's a pretty predictable um, part of human nature. But the, what really surprised me is that other people wanted to hear those stories and that other people wanted to connect with people like them. Um, and I think there's something really human about it. So right away, I saw there was this huge opportunity. Um, Google acquired YouTube for 1.65 billion, which at the time was seen as an incredible mm -hmm. amount of money. And I remember right, be right before we acquired them, Mark Cuban 
wrote this article that said only a moron would acquire YouTube. And then like the <laughs> next week, Google bought YouTube. Um, and when we bought YouTube, you have to realize, too, the reason YouTube sold is because it was going to require a lot more investments, both from a um, the huge amount of growth of networking, machines, et cetera, but also the legal battle. battle. So soon afterwards, uh, we were, YouTube was sued by Viacom, and Google had to invest a significant amount. Um, we wound up winning, winning that lawsuit, but it was, it was an investment that Google made, and I think it was a combination of investment, um, providing some of the technology that Google has, mm -hmm. and then also letting YouTube just be YouTube. Huh. So do you think YouTube should be spun out of now Alphabet? Uh, so I, I don't think so, um, personally. I, you know, our focus is really just on serving the constituents that you said. Uh, um, I'm really focused on responsibility. I'm focused on uh, the four R's that I talked about and thinking about all the different ways we would have to separate from Alphabet is, is really not high on my priority list. Um, I really want to focus on getting the policies right and getting the implementation right and building a great library of content for our users and building businesses. Uh, we use technology from Google that's really helpful, like all the machine learning that I talked about, mm -hmm. being able to find the policies, being able to find the, the violative content, being able to do that at scale. We benefit from the Google technology that's there. So it would be, it, I, I mean, I don't think it would have any benefit for consumers if we were spun out. Um, you've been uh, a big advocate for greater diversity in tech. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, every time I look at the progress reports, you know, it's like 1% a year change for, for <laughs> most companies would be considered good. Um, how, do you, how do you see that fight, you know, maybe really five, six years since it started to heat up? I think it's a long-term, you have to have a long-term perspective on it. And if you look at it over the long term, I actually just looked at the computer science numbers and the number of people who are studying computer science, and there was, there's tremendous progress. Uh, so I, I, First of all, I think it's incredibly important. And the reason I do is because technology is one of the most important forces of change in our society right now. And if you say this is an industry that is changing so many other industries, and this industry is filled up with a select set of people that excludes so many others, that's a problem. You're not going to have um, the best ideas. You're not going to be represented. Those other, those other minority groups are going to be excluded and not have the same advantages. So I think it's incredibly important to have diversity in tech. And I, the, the only way to address it is to, to think about this as long term, that you're consistently trying to bring more women in, into tech. and then the women that are in tech, that you're doing your best to retain them, provide opportunities for them. And it has to, it has to come from the top down. Um, so I wrote this article for Vanity Fair called How to Break Up the Silicon Valley Boys Club. And um, it really was, I, I realized after I wrote it, I was really addressing it to the other leaders of Silicon Valley that they needed to take responsibility for it and mm -hmm. they needed to change their cultures and have the right recruiting and retention for all different types of underrepresented people in, in tech. Yeah. And do you think that's working, though? Do you think people are, are paying attention? Slowly. I think it's working, but slowly. I mean, I wish, it, I, wish I could say it's, it, it's happening faster. Yeah. It is happening, but it's, it's slow. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your competitors quite broadly here. Sure. Um, in between, say, you know, Facebook Video, Netflix, Instagram, TikTok, is there anything on those other platforms that makes you jealous that you go, oh, I wish we had more of that? Oh, well, I mean, I think, first of all, it's an incredible time to be in video. It's, it's, I don't think we've ever seen this much content being created um, and this much change in how we watch video. And I think, in a sense, we all are in different parts. I mean, the way I think about it is there's a, a lot of people who are competing for the head content. Um, and there's a lot of people competing for the user-generated content. Uh, so um, we compete with Twitch, for example, who's owned by Amazon for live streaming, which has been a really important area. Um, Facebook and Instagram are in video. They have, um, I mean, Instagram has, a, a lot of YouTube stars are on Instagram. Mm -hmm. They're doing stories. And then, you know, TikTok, I mean, it's pretty incredible. TikTok is a company that, you know, a year ago wasn't on our radar. Now it's on everybody's radar. Right. Um, and they're doing super, super short videos with music and, and different templated content. And so I think 
Um, sure, I'd love to do all of it, but just the section that we're in, which is this user-generated, but I'd say pro, pro next generation media companies, pro UGC is also what some people call it, um, mm -hmm. YouTube influencer stars, like that area in itself is so big and so important. Um, I really want to make sure that we don't lose focus on what we do well. Yeah. And last question, when will people stop watching regular old linear television? <sighs> you know, I think we sometimes forget how much TV has changed. So just, just literally last week, I was cleaning out my basement, and I found this TV from when I was little. And I was almost embarrassed to show it to my kids because, first of all, it was black and white. Um, second of all, it had this dial um, where you change the channels, and it was hard-coded. It only went up to channel, I think, 68 or 74, and, and yeah. you would have to, you know, it was analog. Click, and click, 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 click. It wasn't yeah. just click, 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 but there were like three different areas. It was like channel 1 to 7, channel 7 to 14, <laughs> channel 14 to 68. And it was hard code. There's no more channels than 68 on there. Yeah. My kids had no idea how to use it, right? They were yeah, like, yeah. oh, does it actually turn on? Like, they were so confused. <laughs> um, um, and so, Sorry, what was your question again? Yeah, so I, when people <laughs> will stop watching television. I mean, I yeah. think if you look at this next generation, a lot of the next generation already has. Um, and they have, well, what they've opted for is they've opted for uh, OTT solution. I mean, you can look at the number of, the number of cable nevers, top, cable yeah. cutters. I mean, it's basically a, a, a sharp drop off, right, yeah. of people who are not subscribing. To, to TV, and I think if you look at this next generation, they will say, you know, why, why should I wait for a show to be on at six? Like, I could just see it all now on this OTT platform. I can see it on my phone. I can, so I think there is a very significant generational focus on yeah. um, moving to OTT platforms, and it, it, it will just continue. And you look at the TV providers themselves, and they're also switching to OTT. I mean, NBC has Peacock, Disney's coming out with Disney Plus, um, CBS, CBS All Access. So you look at the, the providers, they're all switching to OTT, I think, and that's what the users expect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>